uh, and Second Chronicles. And today we are going to talk about why good people make bad choices and how to avoid bad choices and how do we get to, to make these bad uh, choices. And we are going to look at, as our example today, the best of the king uh, in, in that uh, era, the king of Judah, and uh, this is, his name is Jehoshaphat. And he is recognized as the best king of the kingdom of Judah. He did what was right in the eyes of God. He was 35 years old when he became king and he reigned for 25 years. So as we turn to some Old Testament stories, we find the principles of the New Testament and these, these uh, stories. Oh, sorry, the children, we did not uh, <laughs> send you. <Yeah. laughs> Go in peace. <laughs> these examples are so uh, useful to, that we recognize ourselves, we see that. All of us in this room this morning, we would consider ourselves like good people, uh, wise people, spiritual people, and yet we keep making mistakes and we keep making wrong choices and uh, uniting ourselves sometimes with not the, the, the right people. So we, we see that the, the example of the Old Testament people are so much like us. Uh, they, they, they become so, uh, so good example for us and we learn so many lessons for our life. So going in the text, we read from this king, Jehoshaphat, his son, uh, we are talking about the week before uh, Asa, King Asa, so his, his son Jehoshaphat, his son reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. Just pay attention sometimes to the words used or the expression, he strengthened himself against Israel. That will become a bit uh, important later. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because, we know the reason here, he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father. He walked in his commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. Again, you see that he did not walk according to the acts of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established his kingdom. God blessed him, gave him prosperity, success, and all of Judah brought tributes to Jehoshaphat. And he had riches and honor in abundance. And another statement here, it is important, and his heart was lifted high in the ways of the Lord. And he also removed the high places and wooden images for the false uh, gods, the worship of the false gods. Clearly, Jehoshaphat was a very godly man and a godly king, the best in, in, in all. The secret of his success is explained in verse 3 because he chose something for his life. He chose his standard. He, he chose on which side he was, how, his way of life. He walked in the former ways of his father. Uh, here we have an interpretation problem in this text here because it says in the former ways of his father David and some in most of the Bible version. But in the book of Kings, which is a parallel text to that, it says it's according to his father Asa. Because when we look at the life of Asa quite in details the last time, we saw that Asa was a, at a very good beginning, was a strong king, and he followed the Lord, and he was wholeheartedly committed to the Lord as his father David. But then the second part of his life was not very good, and then he walked away. So he, here it would make more sense to, to read that he walked in the former ways of his father, thinking of Asa instead of David. But the, many of the Bibles as David. So whether it is David, it also makes sense because David had also a very good beginning. But in the later years of his life, he committed murder and adultery. 
And you, you, if you look at the life of David, you will see also a similar pattern. He was so successful, he was so powerful, he was such a military man. He was the greatest in terms of conquest, in terms of military power, David was the greatest of all. And his life was great, was just success over success all the time, until in his life he came to this time when he sinned in this way. And from that point on in his life, sorrow came and, and to his family. Maybe he was a powerful political man, a military man with great success, but when it came to his personal life and his family, he experienced more sorrows. So whether you think of David here in this text or Asa, both make sense. Uh, he just followed according to the former days, the time when both of them, uh, whether it is David or Asa, really walk with the Lord. From David, we have learned in this study that he, the Bible used a perfect heart or ho holy committed or devoted to the Lord. That's what it says, which pleased the Lord. And the, the, the David became the, the measuring stick of all the uh, his descendants that, that would be become king uh, after him, they were all measured according to the standards of their uh, ancestor David. He became the, the, the measuring stick. So in this, w where we, we have a lesson for us also in the verse 6. It says that his heart was lifted high. And if you look at many Bible versions, we'll have different. But uh, the original text means exactly that. His heart was high in the ways. His priorities were high. Uh, his, uh, the Word of God had very high priority. Or we could say he took delight in the Word of God. We could uh, see it in, in this way. We, we, we can see that he, some Bible version says his courage his courage rose high when it came to the ways of the Lord. He was courageous. He grew bold into the ways of the Lord. He took great pride in serving the Lord, which would be a good question for all of us here. If we want to apply uh, some example from his life, how about us? Uh, are, are we taking pride in serving the Lord? Are we taking pride in identifying ourselves with Christ? publicly and our way of life and in in our integrity and in our walk and our daily walk and the, the decisions that we make and in our, in our conversations and in our relationship. Uh, are we taking pride in serving the Lord as yet? He has been one of the Judah's finest rulers. No other king have done more to educate the people of God than him. So he was a, a reformer. He, he was a kind of a preacher, a teacher of the word of, of, of the Lord. And he sent out teachers to instruct the people. He did more than anyone else. And we will see it in this text here. In the third year of his reign, he sent out the following officials to teach in the cities of Judah. They took copies of the book of the law, or the scroll of the law, and traveled around through all the towns of Judah teaching the people. Then the fear of the Lord fell over all the surrounding kingdom so that none of them wanted to declare war on Jehoshaphat. Many brought gifts and silver as tribute. So Jehoshaphat became exceedingly powerful. God has blessed him. So this king conceived a system for educating the people in the word of God. This has never been done because most of the king before, they went and destroy the, the, the worship, the high places, the idols over the land. So they, they took an actions to destroy, but none of them really until him has taken a positive step to, to go and teach the word. How can you live according to the standards of God if the population don't know about it? So he really did send, he organized a group of priests and qualified people to go around and teaching the people uh, from God's law. 
No one else traveled the land like this with the goal of systematic teaching of the Word of God. So we can see in a way that he became the ancestor of Christian education. Uh, he, he has done something that had never been done before. The prophets would go and preach a message, but he went into the land all over and he gave them a systematic uh, way to study, understand what the Word of God, that had never been done before. He also was a, uh, the ancestor of modern uh, itinerant preaching, you know, like uh, when the uh, revival took place in England and uh, uh, John Wesley and all of these guys went all over the land and preached. Actually, King Jehoshaphat already done that before them. So he was already a revivalist and a reformer in the land. And actually, it's, it's important for us today because in our generation, as we speak, uh, Bible literacy is slipping away. I was reading uh, an illustration, and I want to share with you. You know that uh, in uh, American TV, you have a lot of uh, uh, late night show. And uh, I don't know if he's still on, on TV. Uh, I'm not uh, really watching it, but Jay Leno, I, I remember seeing some of his uh, late night show. One time he moved through his audience and he was asking people what they knew about the Bible. And he says, uh, name one of the Ten Commandments. And someone says, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> so uh, then he says, name one of the apostles. And uh, no one could be named, not one of the apostles. It says, okay, give me the name of the Beatles. And immediately everybody knew the name of the Beatles at the time, so without hesitation. So he says in this illustration that he was not mocking the Bible or Christians, he was mocking society who claimed to be founded upon Judeo-Christian uh, 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 principles, but then at the same time, they don't even know their own foundation. They cannot see the simple things like the Ten Commandments or things like that. So it, it shows us how this generation is losing touch with the scriptures, and we need to, to reform that, and, and we need people like us. That's why we need to evangelize, we need to share the gospel, we need to, to come alive and to be bold, and to just like we, we read about uh, this wonderful king, to, to be high in the ways of the Lord. Can you be high in the ways of the Lord this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, okay, it's a weak yes, but okay. Hopefully it will become stronger with time. Godliness. What is godliness and how, how do we grow into godliness? Godliness comes from knowing and accepting the word of God. But it takes something more. It takes the willingness to live by it. Otherwise, it's not going to be uh, so useful. So it's not enough to know. We know, but we accept that it is the word of God. But we also are willing to live by it. And then, then the next interesting point in this text in verse 10 here. The fear of the Lord fell over all the surrounding kingdoms. Here we see a text that resembled very much a text that we read in the book of Acts. When the Holy Spirit was filling the heart of the disciples. When miracles were being done. And where the Holy Spirit was the doing the same work and the New Testament as he is doing there in that time. That's a very interesting to, to read that. This is a proof of God's presence, an act, a powerful act of God, that he can transform society, that he can uh, impact. This is actually a definition or an illustration of a revival. What is a revival? How do a revival take place in a, in a country or in a land? It's when the people are seized by the reality of God, by the word of God, and then it becomes important, it becomes real again. And then we see it happen under this great king and Judah at that time. When God is put first and godly leaders stand with God, great things can happen. And God blessed this faithful servant of him and he made him exceedingly great, powerful in all of these things. But the story of Jehoshaphat is also about a godly, good king, but had a weakness. And the weakness that he had was with compromise. We all are good people here, and we all have strength 
and weaknesses. This king had weaknesses with choosing friends and making plans and associating himself with certain things. So that is, uh, you know, he was a very godly king. He had great things going for him, but at the same time, we learn from a human being just like us about his, his weaknesses. And we could see about his bad choices of friends and alliances. And one of the statements I want to bring to you this morning is compromise is dangerous for even the most godly of believers. Uh, we all can fall into something like that. Why did Jehoshaphat and why do we fall into the problem of compromise? Making bad choices, associating with people we shouldn't. And we see that the trap of compromise, how compromise developed. And we go to the next scriptures, Second Chronicle chapter 18, I think. Joseph had at riches and honor and abundance, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab. He joined affinity in the kingdom, I think it says with him. Like he joined in marriage. He made a covenant with the king of Israel that was the, one of the most ungodly kings ever. So he, he, it's strange because he chose that his son, him being a defender of the, of the faith and God and following God, he was not seeking the Baals, he was seeking God and he was living according to the ways of the Lord. He was high in the ways of the Lord and then he, he chose to marry his son into a very, very ungodly family. So earlier, we had read that Joseph had strengthened himself against Israel. And the word against here, when we look and study uh, the original text, it says above. He strengthened himself above. So from the beginning of his, of his reign, King Jehoshaphat was determined to rise above the ways of Israel. He was not going to live like that. He was not going to yield to this, but he was going to live above that. Jehoshaphat knew Ahab and his very ungodly wife, Jezebel, what they were doing in the north. So the first compromise that uh, Jehoshaphat uh, came with is through a marriage alliance with the family of Ahab and Jezebel. Jehoshaphat arranged a marriage between his son Jehoram and the daughter of the king Ahab and Jezebel and the daughter's name was Atalia. And later on you will find Atalia again in the continuation of, of the stories of what happened through the lineage of the descendants of David as king of Judah. Ahab was a very wicked man indeed. And then I think you most are ahead of me by now and you have read this text. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight even more than any of the kings before him. So he's not only bad, he's worse than anyone. But then, look at what comes next. As if it was not enough to be that bad, he did something to go even worse than that. So he married a very ungodly uh, Jezebel, who was a daughter of the Sidonians. I don't know, maybe I'm not, I'm mispronouncing it. And he began to bow down and worship of Baal. We read also about uh, his wife. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. And again, you find the power of influence in this text. And the word incited, uh, actually, it's to prick. It's to bring uh, seductions and uh, persuasion, enticing. So we will see that a, it, it seems to be like a simple decision, but a simple compromise like this here will have far-reaching consequences. And we will uh, discover in our lives that most of the time, the destructive effect of an ungodly alliance 
or compromise will be seen much later. Whether it is in marriage or whether it is in business transactions. If it is in marriage, the girl who is a Christian find this guy who is not a Christian. And the guy says, oh, it's okay, I'm not a Christian, but it's okay, go to church, it's fine, you can practice your own things. I, I'm not. Oh, okay, good. Then the pastor talks to the girl, says, it's better not to marry an unbeliever because you will have difficulties in the future. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay, he loves me, I love him. <laughs> and then uh, he, he even told me it's okay for me to continue to go to church. It's fine, but wait wait later and at one point it will become a source of tensions, source of conflicts, maybe leading to, to divorce or really uh, very bad things that is coming on the way, especially when children comes in before or w with money issues or whatever it is. It will come because it cannot. What, how, what, what is common between uh, light and darkness? Uh, the Bible is saying very clearly do not uh, be unequally yoked with non-believers because we don't share the same the same principles we don't have the same things it is in business principles oh, of course of course I want to start a business and this guy has money and he's helping me to you know and we will make money and we will be successful yeah very good but at some point we may cheat the government not pay our taxes we might choose a way that you know this way that we know I want to be honest but the other one doesn't want and there will be uh, things so many times the distress destructive effect of ungodly alliance and compromise comes later on uh, at some point, whether it is in marriage or business or any other areas of relationship. Then in other uh, areas of uh, compromises in a military alliance, uh, one compromise when you start this way lead to another because well, when, when we yield to it shows some, something about how our mind and our heart works. Our eyes are blinded, uh, or, or the, the strength of our will is weakened, and there are other benefits maybe to get or something like that. So a few years later, Josephat went down to visit Ahab. Now they are uh, partners in marriage, so they, are, they have an alliance in marriage, who prepared a great banquet. We can see he had a, a great barbecue for him. Be careful of barbecue. <laughs> Will you go with me to attack Ramat Galeon? And he answered, I'm as you are, my people, as your people, we will be with you in the war. So they have a barbecue, they eat a lot of food, they have a great time together. Then he asked him to go to war. That's a big decision. You're going to war. You're not going just to... Uh, uh, do a simple transaction or something like that. You're going to war. You're going to bring your, your army. You're going to, to kill people and maybe being killed. And immediately he answered, I am as you are. Immediately, no time to think. He's, he's, he's already doing that. So while at the barbecue, Ahab does the same thing as his wife Jezebel has done to him. He incited him persuaded him to, to, to come into this venture together. So lo look at how it, it develops here. This is, this, is, this is really interesting. Jehoshaphat immediately committed himself, and not only himself, but the people, the soldiers and everything. But you can tell that deep down in that story, uh, deep down he didn't have peace. Because if you look at verse 4, it says, Joseph had added, but uh, wait, first, let us inquire for the word of the Lord. What does the Lord say about this? But he's already committed. So he should have said it before. He said it after. He's already given his word. He's the king. Cannot lose face at this point. So it was too late. He already declared. It's just like people today. We decide first what we intend to do, and then we inquire of the Lord. Because we want the Lord to approve what we've already decided. Please say amen to that. Amen. Hey, I think it's a... <laughs> I think we recognize ourselves in that. Okay. Compromise sucks you in deeper. First, he gave his son in marriage. After that, he accepted the hospitality and the barbecue. And then after that, he foolishly and too, way too fast committed himself to go to war with an ungodly king. So now look at this 
situation, when you look, I did not put all the, 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 the text because it would be very long, but that's a very interesting story. Now he is this, this, go this godly king, followers of God, is sitting surrounded by 400 false prophets who are saying all sorts of false messages. He's sitting in their midst. And there is only one true prophet of God, Micah, who speaks the truth. And he is the godly king who watched this prophet being slapped around, beaten, tied, and thrown in prison. And he doesn't even raise his voice, intervene, oppose this unfair treatment of the only true prophet of God. That's what compromise uh, leads us to. It sucks us uh, deeper. But I have given my word. It's like a boxer who trained himself for the big fight. And then just before the fight, his opponent invites him out for dinner and he slipped poison into his coffee. So there would be not big fight and not big win because he's already <laughs> down. So when Micah, the prophet of God, spoke to the two kings, he announced in advance that the battle will not go well for them. The word of the Lord, he says, first, inquire of the Lord. The prophet says it's not going to go well, and he even prophesied clearly that King Ahab will die in that battlefield. And these two kings ignore the warning and just go on to battle. That's what happened. They disregarded God's guidance. And we can see here the de deceptive power of compromise. Remember the story of Lot in the Bible? Lot had compromised and he was living in the city of Sodom. And the angel of the Lord came into Sodom to rescue Lot, to save him out of the city. How much pulling and dragging they had to do? How Lot didn't want to go, to go. He was not ready yet to go. No, his wife didn't want to go. They were stuck there and they had, the, the, the angels had to drag them out of the, of the city. We can see deception, the power of deceptions and compromise there. In order to know, if you are to inquire of the word of the Lord, when you make decision, you must first be willing to listen to what God is going to say, what other Christians is going, are going to advise you. If they are Christian, if they are spirit-filled, if they are true friends, they will come up with some advice to you. So you, would, you should be able to willing. But you know sometimes what you find, and I've already mentioned it, but people come to you for advice because they want you to agree with them. And if, if, if you don't, then they will just disregard your advice and just, just find another one. So first, if you want to inquire of the ways of the Lord, first be honest with yourself and be willing to obey and, and, to, and to listen and be prepared to obey. What is a compromise? I was thinking of that and that this is the definition I came up with. Compromise is also knowing the word of God. To compromise, you, you must know it first, because you, you, you choose something else. But you know. If you don't know it, you're not compromising, because you are ignorant. You're just doing whatever. But if to be called a compromise, you need first to know what the Word says. You accept that it is the Word. You, you know the Word. You've been reading the Word. You know what it says. But you choose not to follow it. And that's what a compromise is. Not willing. Uh, you have already chosen to do something that you believe will benefit you more. You've already made your mind, so you compromise because you have another way around. You think you will get more. You think you will benefit of that. And it is because of human reasoning and justifying our actions, while at the same time we are minimizing the neg negative effect or the negative consequence. We make it like it's not really a big deal. It's not going to touch other people. Nobody will know. It's not going to affect nobody but me, blah, 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 blah. We are very good in justifying uh, our bad actions. Would you say amen to that as well? Okay, okay. You are so honest today. <laughs> So they, 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 they both uh, disregard the king, uh, the, the prophet's warning. Ahab is killed on the battlefield. And then 
I think here, you see how God is so gracious. You know, don't be discouraged this morning, even though you recognize, you know, the, the weaknesses and, and so many times we make the wrong decisions and we, we deceive ourselves so many times and we, we want to do what we want to do. Don't, don't, don't beat yourself too much because God is so gracious. And God is not finished with us. And he, he, he can restore you. He, he, he can forgive. And he can teach us some good lessons and transform our life, as we can see in this text here. The, on the battlefield, the, the enemies, commanders, they saw King Jehoshaphat dressed as a king. Ahab disguised himself as a, as a normal soldier. So the, 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 all the military forces turned to King Jehoshaphat. So when they came to kill the king, he cried out, I think we read it here, Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord saved him. Who saved him? He was foolish. He already disobeyed the Lord. He's already made up his mind. He already disregarded the Lord. But the Lord is so gracious, he saved him. And God helped him by turning the attackers away from him. God is so wonderful. Say amen to that. Amen. Only by God's grace we can survive in this life. Hallelujah. If you remember, many of us, maybe we have not read this text for a long time, but I went through quickly last night. Roman chapter 3, when it concludes that all of us are under the power of sin. This story reminds us of our sinful nature. No one seeks God. No one does good. Not one is good. No one is righteous before God. And yet, God saves us. And yet God saves all of us by faith. Amen? Amen? That's grace. It is by grace. It's the gift of God so that no one can boast, oh, I'm good enough. I, I've done more good than bad. You remember this, uh, these illustrations that are often shared uh, by people when, when they are confronted to the sinfulness. Oh, in my life, I have more good than bad, so that makes me right with God. No, it doesn't make you right with God. If you are not 100% perfect, you are not perfect. So s sin doesn't come up with God, but we can be saved only because of the grace of God, because the, the wonderful love of, of, of our God. Amen? Amen? And then we read that Joseph, as a result of being saved by God, returned in safety or in peace to his house in Jerusalem. But Jehu, a seer, a prophet, met him and rebuked him. God saves us, but God has a word for us. God wants to show us where we have done something wrong. Because God loves us so much that he wants to lead us to repentance, to change our ways, to come back to him so that we can enjoy again his presence, to be refreshed, to be restored, to be loved, and to, 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 be, to be under God's blessing again. So he sent his servant, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. Nevertheless, God is so good, God is so merciful, some good is found in you. He was a good man. Like most of us, we are good. But how do good people like us make bad choices? It's because we are reminded of our sinful nature, of our pride, of our greed, of our lust, of our inclinations to sins and all of these things because it's part of us. But we have the grace of God working at the same time in our life. So nevertheless, some good is found in you because you have set your heart to seek God. So that's what God wants of us this morning and all the time. And we have seen it in every message since the beginning. God is seeking everywhere, scanning the earth. We, we finished with that verse last time we spoke on that subject. The eyes of the Lord runs through and fro. He's scanning all the world to find those whose heart are perfect or wholly committed to him so that he can show himself strong to them. So we, we come again to the same thing. I have found something good in you. What, what can God find good in us? 
it is our heart. It is our heart that is still seeking after him. The heart that desire God, even though we, we fail, even though we, we, we keep on repeating some things that is, should not, God has not finished with us. God is faithful. I, I think many of you love this verse in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Verse 6. God is faithful. He who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He, he will continue to bring us and to lift us up. And God is, is very gracious here because even though God can rebuke us, he never forget that there are also good things in us for, for God going on. He sees the good. And, and he says, I was uh, thinking of the letters uh, of Jesus to the seven churches. Actually, I just began that section in my daily devotion. Uh, I know your works. I know the things you do for me. I know, I, know, I see, I, I, I appreciate all the good things. But I have one complaint against you. I have one complaint against you. So just go back, change back, return to me. That's all God wants. So God knows the good. He knows the bad, and he offers us to just come back to him and keep on trusting and walking with him. That's very, very encouraging. So Jehoshaphat didn't die in the battle, but what was the consequence of this compromise? What did it do to him? He came back as a broken soldier, a king who had, you know, he was such a great leader. He built an army of 1,200,000 soldiers. That's what he did. He was exceedingly great and powerful. He brought reforms in the education. He brought reforms in the justice system. He was a great, great king. But now he went to war with an ungodly king. He had been warned by God. He disobeyed, he disregarded. God saved him. And now he's coming back of that uh, near-death experience and he's learning a lesson. He's learning a lesson. And he's willing to change. There's an illustration I want to uh, share with you. There's a little boy who had a bad conduct. And the father told him, every time you will be naughty, I will uh, drive a nail in the post. So of course, there was a lot of nails in the post. But then at some point, the little boy started to change. And he became kind, and he started to do good things. So the father says, OK, every time you do something good, I will remove a nail from the post. Okay. So after a while, he does more good things than bad things. And he, the father invites the boy to go to the post, and he's going to pull the last nail. So the little boy was not happy. But dad, the holes of the nails are still there. So, son, the nails that I have removed is my forgiveness. But the mark of the nails is still there. And that, that, sh that teaches us a, a, a principle in our life about, about consequences and things like that. God's forgiveness is always there. God's faithfulness is always there. Amen? Amen. So, it was a near-death experience, and we will finish with that story for this morning. Then we see his repentance. Then he went back to live in Jerusalem. It means that he dwelled in Jerusalem. He went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim. Beersheba is the southern borders of the kingdom of Judah. Mountains of Ephraim are the northern kingdom. So he goes all over the land where he is king. And he is showing fruits of repentance. The people that he misled through his wrong alliances is going to bring them back to the Lord. So he's not only showing repentance to God, but he's really changing. He's really returning to the people and bringing the people, uh, influencing them back to bring to the Lord. And then that's when he inaugurated a, a, a reform a, a judicial system, a, a system of justice that would be very good. And uh, we read in this text, take heed. He sets up judges to go through all the land. And then he says, take heed to what you are doing for you. Do not judge for man, but you are judging for the Lord. And the Lord is with you in judgment. And let the fear of the Lord be upon you. And that is the best advice that he has given us. When you make decisions, 
when you are going to ally yourself uh, with someone else, when you are going to do a business transactions, when you are going to make such an important decision as getting a boyfriend or a fiance or something, when you are going to you know, uh, establish your circle of relationship, do it in the fear of the Lord. Let the Lord be part of your, of your decision. And that is such a, an essential principle for our life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let me just uh, share with you. La, 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 I'm still skipping a little bit. Because there's more and there's story. But because of time, I just want to okay, look at uh, these uh, scriptures here. Just a reminder of Just Was Life, some of the highlights and some of the lessons we can learn. Now the Lord was with Joshua, 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 because he walked in the former ways of his father. His heart was lifted high in the ways of the Lord. Nevertheless, some good is found in you, for you destroy the, the idols and you have set your heart to seek the Lord. And then I come to the New Testament and these parts here. He saved us, not because of the righteous things, of the good that we could have done, because we do good things mixed with not so good, but because of his mercy. And the story of the Bible is the story of God's mercy. The story of the Bible is redemption, it is salvation, it is rescue, all because of the mercy and the love of God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know all the things that you do. That you, I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. And then says, I have one thing against you, that you have forsaken your first love. Now turn back to me and do the works that you did at first. So we, we all err at some point and we, we miss the mark. Uh, the, the, the definition of sinning in the New Testament uh, from the Greek word amarsia, actually it has become a branch of theolo theology, amarsiology, that is the, the, the branch of theology. It means the study of sin uh, and it, it is based on that, it is missing the mark. And we all have that uh, potential in our lives. Even though we, we, we seek the Lord, even though we have uh, high, uh, we, we set high in the ways of the Lord, even though we have done good things for the Lord, there are times where we miss the mark. But the mercy of God lasts forever and this is how we will make it to heaven so in our discouragement in our difficulties in our temptations in all the wrong areas of our life and where we have flaws in our life and compromise and made the wrong choices of the past and some, some of us are, have to live with some of these consequences even today and many of us have regret from the past God is love and the grace of the Lord is part of our life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Would you stand, please? Praise God. <clears throat>